Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's all grab our hymn books. Stand with me and turn to page 230. Surely goodness and mercy. Sing it out with me, verse number one. A pilgrim was high and a wandering. In a cold night of sin I did roam. When Jesus, the kind shepherd, found me. And now I am on my way home. Here we go. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Verse 2, he restoreth my soul when I'm weary. He giveth me strength day by day. He leads me beside the still waters. He guards me each step of the way. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my, here we go. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. When I walk through the dark, lonesome valley, my Savior will walk with me there, and safely his great hand will lead me to the mansions he's gone to prepare. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all the days of my life. Amen. Aren't you glad? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, to be in your house. Lord, we pray that you just put your hedge around this building, Father. I pray for the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate revelation to us as we begin chapter 15. And Father, we love you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Does anybody have a praise? Yes, that we're in an air-conditioned building. I love that. They say that this uh, July is going to be miserable. That means that August is going to be miserable. Amen. That means September will be even better. October and November. Or, uh, yeah, those will be beautiful. Amen. <laughs> yeah, I work in it, so it's not. It's actually you get used to it a little bit, right? Until uh, you melt, all right? Amen. Anybody have a praise? Amen. That's it? Lord Jim? Amen. Me too. Remember, uh, uh, Miss Pat, uh, she had to go back to the hospital. Okay, so she, you remember she had blood clots and uh, they had to leave it open on her leg and it got infected. So uh, I don't know if she's still there, but I do know that she was at the hospital this morning. So keep her in prayer. Amen. Keep the Sanchez family in prayer. Amen. I hope that everything goes smoothly for the uh, funeral and the viewing. Don't forget that. Uh, the viewing is tomorrow night at 6 to 8. It's right here at Wayne Bowes. Uh, it's right there. It's right off the 287 Business, 
right under the underpass where the railroad track goes. It's not hard to find. And uh, so we'll be there. I'll be there at 5 o'clock. We'll be there early with the family. It opens at 6, so if you'll come, uh, as soon as you come in the door, you turn to the right, and we'll be down there right to the right, so that's where the viewing will be. So everyone's invited to that. And then the, the funeral is at the same place at 10 o'clock in the morning. Amen? So I think that... Uh, uh, the funeral, they're, they're wanting it to be about an hour, so we'll probably leave out of there around 11 and be at the grave site before, it's right there, so it's not even seconds from the funeral home, so we'll probably be at the grave site for literally only a few minutes, however long it takes for everybody to walk over, and uh, that will only be short. I have one verse, and uh, then they'll lower her in the vault, and we'll all be leaving, and, and then we'll be coming back here. I hope the church family will come back here and, and help with the lunch. That would be great, right? The more help, the better. Amen. All right. Anything else? When is what? Right after the funeral. Yeah, probably around 12. Give or take. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can't really... Yeah, we can't really uh, can't really have enough time. We have no idea, really. All we can do is guesstimate. So as far as trying to know what time, and, and then we don't know who all is going to come either. So, but anyways, all righty. Don't forget. Now we're going to be out of town after the funeral. After everything's cleaned up here, we're going to Colorado for the wedding, and so you'll have Brother uh, Marvin. Uh, Mungle here this Sunday, a guest speaker. Amen. So don't miss. That means I won't be here for prayer, but it doesn't mean that we can't have prayer. Uh, James has got a key, and uh, ladies can still meet, and uh, James can lock it up on Saturday. So we can still do men's and ladies' prayer on Saturday. And uh, don't miss church. Amen. Just because I'm not here, still have we still have church. And Brother Mungle will be with you on the next Wednesday as well, him and his son and his son's wife. Amen. So, but anyways, but pray for them. And we have a lot of things coming up, don't we? All right. We'll pray that God gives me the energy to get through. Amen. <laughs> and uh, praise the Lord, my poison ivy is doing a little better. Amen. Thankful for that. Amen. A little bit of steroids goes a long ways, right? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and stand one more time and we'll sing page number 137. Yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, how sweet the glorious message simple faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the to save the sinful, heal the sick and lame, cheer the mourner, still the tempest, glory to his name. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus Glory to his name. He who pardoned erring Peter, neighbor, needst thou fear. He that came to faithless Thomas, all thy doubt will clear. He who let the loved disciple on his bosom rest, bids thee still with love as tender lean upon his breast. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. He who mid the raging billows walked upon the sea. Still can hush our wildest tempest as on Galilee. He who wept and prayed in anguish in Gethsemane drinks with us each cup of trembling in our agony. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. 
All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Amen. As of old he walked to Emmaus with them to abide. So through all life's way he walketh ever near our side. Soon again shall we behold him, hasten, Lord, the day. But twill still be this same Jesus as he went. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name, glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name, amen. You may be seated. Man, aren't you glad he never changes? <laughs> so thankful for that. I change, amen. Jesus never changes. Revelations chapter 15. Does everybody have their notes this evening? I know I handed them out last last Wednesday night. Does everybody need anybody need a set of Revelation 15 notes? Before we get started, everyone has a set. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and open our Bibles. Revelations chapter 15. We'll go ahead and read the whole chapter, and then we'll go ahead and get into the introduction. That'll just kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at. But let's read chapter 15. If we're there, there's only eight verses. You say, boy, this is a thin set of notes. Well, there's only <laughs> eight verses, all right? So Revelation 15, it says in verse number one, is everyone there? It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Amen. All right, well, let's go ahead and go to our notes. I hope you have your pen ready. Roman numeral uh, one here on chapter 15. Everyone has their pens ready. The, the blank is the end of God's long suffering. The end. Well, I'm glad we're not in the, that part. Aren't you glad the Lord still... You know, think about that. Uh, the Lord's still long-suffering for us. Praise God for that. The word end there is uh, crucial for you to understand uh, because that means he's done. All right, I'm just going to help you with this a little bit. That means that it's uh, coming to a close. All right, that means sin is going to be complete. It's going to be the conclusion, blaspheming God. Uh, it'll be the finished work. It will be final. These will be uh, final decisions. There will not be any more calling. Uh, there will be not be any more uh, long-suffering, no more mercy. This is full-on judgment. That's what wrath of God is. Now think about this. Uh, we're all reserved out of the wrath of God. Amen? Uh, so these are people who have decided uh, to go against God, and they will not win, friend. 
They will not win. All right. So look at A, the introduction. You say, I don't understand why they're making these choices. Well, we've already talked about that. Uh, they've ma it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we heard someone say they can't wait to get to hell. That's where they're going, and they know it. And let me help you with that. That kind of breaks my heart because when they get there, they're going to be put, they've literally put their foot in their mouth, and they're going to be uh, saying they were stupid. Amen. And you say we shouldn't call people. Well, we're going to find out here in this chapter that God calls them stupid. Okay. And so let's, that's a good word. Amen. All right. So my wife can't get on me now. A hey, introduction to the vile judgments. This is the introduction to the vile judgments. Chapter 15 is an introduction, uh, introductory vision to the seven last judgments of God. And it goes together with chapter 16. As a review of the general course of events as the, given in the book of Revelation. Uh, isn't that nice? We've got this little chart here for you to look at. It shows you the chapters and verses and it shows you the seven seals. It shows you the seven trumpets. It also lines up the chapters and lets you see where the parenthetical visions were. Or the explanation chapters were, you know, chapter 7, chapter 10 to uh, chapter 11, verse 14. Then we see where it picks up the introductory ver vision, shows the persons, the preview, and the prelude. That's before, amen. Then it shows you here the vials. Uh, they start here. The 15 is the prelude to the vials. This is kind of explaining what's going to happen. This is all that's happening right before the vials are poured out. So when we get to chapter 16, uh, we're going to literally see the vials being poured out. Now we're going to talk about what those vials are here in chapter 15. Okay. All right, so if you look on, we'll see another parenthetical vision. That will be another explanation there in chapter 17 and 18. And then we see the return of Christ. So if you look at it, if you take out the parenthetical, uh, the vials happen in chapter 16, and then we see the return of God. So we're right there at the end of the book. Amen. So you start praying with me what God have us to do next. Amen. Of course, we've got several months left here, but, uh, but the wrath of God, the return of Christ is coming. All right, let's look at the next page, B. An analysis of the diagram. We'll go over it with just these notes that they have here. The diagram above gives the time, time sequence of events. And this helps you. you got to go back there and re remember that the parenthetical chapters are not in a time. That's an explanation. So if you look at Revelations in a whole and take those out, there's several chapters of just explanation. And rightfully so, we need them, don't we? We need them. So uh, the diagram gives you the time sequence, and this is important to have. I hope that you don't throw these notes away. But this time sequence of events between the rapture and revelation, uh, we note the following. Number one, the announcement of the end. This occurs, A, remember in Revelation 16, 17, the sixth seal. Remember the sixth seal contains all the trumpet and the vile judgments. B, the seventh trumpet, and C, the first vial, there in verse number 1. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, and great and marvelous, and seven angels, and the seven last plagues, for in them uh, is filled up the wrath of God. The wrath of God is going to be filled up in a vial, in seven vials, amen, that will be poured out by seven angels. Think about that. How would you like to have the wrath of God poured out you on a... Uh, Boy, that's insane. That would be like a, a vial. Remember, it's like a, a container or a cup that's dipped and poured on the earth. All right. The book of Revelation is the book of the end. Capital E-N-D. And a book of judgment. Yet we find God graciously giving warnings along the way, hasn't he? Yeah. Number two, the cry of the tribulation saints. Interspersed along the narrative, we read of the cry of those who will be saved and martyred. We see the cry. They said in Revelation 6 and 10 there in A, How long? How long, God, will you allow them to kill us? How long will we be persecuted? Amen. Now, God has heard those prayers, remember, and vengeance is his. This will be the answer to their prayer. You say, I don't know if my prayer ever gets answered. Not according to your timeline, but it will be according to God's, all right? 
The next thing we see is their victory song in verse number 3 there. It says in verse 3 of 15, And they sing the song of Moses, which we'll get into that here in just a minute, but that's uh, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy. He has uh, songs there. And the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just true are thy ways, thou King of saints. See. The third sign in heaven, in verse number 1, there are three signs. The first sign we see in Revelations 12 and 1, which is God's people, Israel. Israel. The second sign we've seen in heaven in Revelations chapter 12 and verse number 3, God's enemy, it was Satan. So we see Israel, Satan, and number three, here in verse number one, we see God's servants, which are angels. All right, D, the seven last plagues. Kind of sad, isn't it? Seven last plagues. You know, uh, when I think of last, and uh, we have the funeral coming up, uh, I don't know what jumps in my head. This may be their last chance to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This is the last chance these people have to receive Christ as their Savior. This could be the last chance. We need to remember that when we meet people, that could be the last chance they have opportunity. So if we don't witness to them or if we're not Christ-like to them, that they could never, ever have another opportunity that we just folded in on. We've got to remember that we're here for God. We're here to witness to God. This is sad. I don't like seeing and talking about the, the last days, the no more chance God has done because they've totally refused Him. And we've got to do all we can do. Amen? There's a great falling away. And the Lord's calling is going to call His church home. And if we haven't done all that we're supposed to do, there are going to be people that are going to die and go to hell. And that should scare us. We, we don't want anybody to go there. Amen. Uh, the Lord wants all to go to heaven. Number one, this implies the seal and the trumpet judgment were also plagues. Of course they were. Or divine judgments. Even though some of the seal judgment were results of the actions of man. Remember we talked about that. The seals, remember, as he opened them up, uh, you know, even though those were plagues by God, but he allowed men to, to uh, destroy themselves. Amen. Uh, you know what's interesting is God holds things in balance. All right. He does. Uh, but at this time, he allows the balance. He doesn't uh, intercede on some of that wickedness. He lets man destroy himself. And some of the trumpet judgments come from hell and from the hand of Satan. We've seen that where uh, uh, Satan is loosed and uh, uh, God allows the angel to open up the bottomless pit. And uh, so what happens is God allows the demons to do whatever they want to do. Why? Judgment. Plagues. Let me ask you something. You don't think that God's restraining them now? That's why some are in the bottomless pit? The bottomless pit is not hell. Remember, the bottomless pit is where all the fallen angels, God, I don't know who knows when he put them there. They had done something to cross the line and he's locked them in the bottomless pit. Now, Satan will go there here soon. We've already seen he gets, he gets to be thrown down there. But there are angels and four generals that are already locked in the bottomless pit. And God allows an angel to come open that. That's part of the judgments, plagues of God. God is not allowing Satan and his angels to do what they want. There's a limit. Well, God, until the church is taken home, there's a limit. We're the limiter. They can only do so much. But if the church would get right, that limit would be greater. Are you following me? But the church isn't right. And so the limit is pushed. It's, it's, it's disgustingly pushed far. And what's sad is we're seeing it in even Baptist churches. I was uh, astounded watching a Baptist church service and uh, how it looked almost just like one of these non-denominational. Uh, I'm like, where, where are we going? Where's the Bible? Where's the real preaching? Where's the real teaching? 
Uh, I'm telling you, we've got to get right with God. We've got to get out there. Hey, I'm telling you, God can use David. God can use a small person and create a great thunder. We just got to get right with him. Amen. There's people that are dying and going to hell. They don't even know if they're saved. They think they're saved because they go to church and feel happy. Let me tell you, the end of that is coming. The end of that is coming. All right. So judgments from hell and the hand of Satan, they were nonetheless by God's permission. I have that highlighted really big. Uh, God allowed it. Why? Because this is a tribulation. Amen. God, I'm telling you, uh, the wrath of God uh, was boiling and he calls the church home and you don't think that it was boiling a little bit, but here in chapter number 15 and 16, he's at it to the rim and whenever you watch something boil up, what happens if you don't blow on it? <laughs> it goes all over the stove, right? Yeah. Hey, I've learned that. I've been cooking oatmeal. <laughs> yeah, I guess no one else cooks oatmeal, amen. Number two, this shows the finality of events. These judgments bring humanity to the last moments of their rebellion against God. They are the last. Are you hearing? It's it. God's done. It's the last. That's, that's sad. After all this grace and all this mercy... It is the end. It's the last. E, God's wrath is filled up. If you look in verse number 1, and it says at the very last, it's in them is filled up the wrath of God. His wrath is filled up. This is truly the end of the long-suffering of God. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, we're, we're, uh, we like to hear the preaching of how God is so long-suffering. Long, the Bible says He is. And He's sure been long-suffering for all these years. But there comes an end. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. Are you there? It says, The Lord is not what? Slack concerning His promises. One of them is, is that He is going to have vengeance. There will be judgment. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but His long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in that which the heavens uh, shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also uh, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Are you listening? It says, but the day of the Lord. Now, let me help you with that. We've learned that there are two, there's a simultaneous day at the rapture and the rapture, the day of Christ is for saints, friend. He's not talking about your day. He's talking about the day of the Lord, which is the day of judgment. So if you don't read that scripture right, you're like, yeah, the day of the Lord is going to come. That's <laughs> talking about us. No, that's talking about judgment, friend. He's saying the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Judgment's going to come as a thief in the night, friend. Yeah, it's coming. I, I, I heard another preacher say on Facebook, if God would just open up hell in the center of, of the church, maybe they'd get on fire for God and start winning people to the Lord because they'll realize how, uh, how awful it's going to be. It's going to be awful. Psalms chapter number 7. I still don't understand how people can uh, hate preachers and hate to hear the Bible and hate to hear about heaven. And hey, you know what? You get around uh, families when they're having funerals and you begin to see how some of the lost people hate to hear about God and uh, just get up rudely and walk away. It just blows me away. And you're talking about the glories of heaven and it just makes them sick. Well, they're going to be sick and when they get to hell. That breaks my heart. I don't, I don't say that with a happy heart. And we've got a lot of people that think that they are saved and won't darken the doors of the church. I'm going to tell you, I think there's going to be a sad day in heaven one day for all those professing Christians and not possessing Christians. And, you know, that, that's a sad day as well. Psalms chapter number 7. If you look down at verse number 11, the Bible says, all, we're going to go to 13. God judgeth the righteous... And God is what? Angry with who? Every day. Hey, God's going to judge the righteous, friend. We will be judged according to our works. But God's not angry with us. God's angry with the who? Let me tell you something. I want you to remember Lot. 
Now God was patient. There's long suffering there. But there was only three people saved from the wrath of God, just so you know. And Lot was just as wicked as they were. And God was just as angry with him. And if he would have turned or not left, he would have went to a devil's place called hell as well. Amen. The Bible says in verse number 12, if he turned not, do you, you see, there's Lot. He didn't turn. I praise God. Aren't you glad? At least there was three saved. But they weren't very good, were they? You know, I'm going to be honest. I, I remember preaching that, I don't know, 15 years ago, how the church is lot like Lot and have cast into Sodom. And look, we are. Where is everybody? It's Wednesday night. It's ball game night or I'm tired from work. If he turn not, he will wet his sword he hath bent his bow, and he made it ready. He's talking about the Lord. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. Let me tell you something. God's long suffering right now, but that's about over. It's about over. That's a sad day when we have, uh, we have the things that are going on in this, this great country that God allowed us to be in. All right, let's look underneath E. We're living in an age of grace. Aren't you glad? But we're getting to the end of that as well. Where we continually experience the long-suffering of God. That's your blank. I'm sure you guessed that. But His wrath and judgment have been brewing. One of the more recent illustrations of what's going to happen at the close of Daniel's 70th week is the eruption of Mount St. Helens volcano. Who, how many remembers that? I remember that being in school, amen, and I remember teachers bringing the ash, and I remember seeing the ash. How many remembers how, how gray it was, and, and ash was falling? I couldn't believe it. All the way in Wyoming, I don't know how, how bad it was here, but it was pretty bad in Wyoming. It was all over the place, and so this was a huge event, wasn't it, which occurred in devastating effect on early Sunday morning, May 18, 1980. Tremors were taking place months before the eruption. Tremors. That means there are they were preludes. There were warning signs. Now you pay attention to this. This is a picture. There are warning signs. What do you think I am? There are warning signs of God's coming home or God's calling us home before the tribulation. There are warning signs. If you don't think there are, you're crazy. Six weeks before the eruption. The volcano began to bulge on its north side. I don't know about you, I'm out of there. Yeah. But it's just like today. There's warning signs everywhere and no one's stopping. The side, it says it's north side at the rate of over one meter a day. The pressure was building up. Despite all these warnings, police had difficulty getting people to leave the area. Keeping sightseers away. Can you imagine? Everybody's stopping. I was uh, watching this the other day, and uh, I was another preacher, and he says, Isn't it funny how all the people will go and look at all the awful negative things that are going on? If there's a wreck or someone's dying, everybody wants to look. But if it has to look at something positive or good, oh, yeah, it's beautiful going 80 miles an hour. So beautiful. But if there's a wreck, and you'll stop traffic, and everybody has to stop so you can see if uh, you can see any blood we're always searching for negative but never looking for the good oh we want to go see him out St. Helens we got to be there but we don't want to go look at the good or tell the good of what God has for us he should be away from the negative and be away from the wicked things and we should be with the good things and here we see in all kinds of jokes were being made it sounds just like what happened before God sent the flood for 120 years they made fun of Noah and he was a moron. He didn't know what he was doing. They've never seen rain before. They didn't know what he was talking about. There's not going to be any flood. What are you talking about? Flood? We don't even know what a flood is. There was a flood, wasn't there? But the volcano blew out on its side. Two and one half billion cubic meters devastated 400 square kilometers of land, boiling fish in the rivers, blackening out the sun, killing 25 confirmed and 47 presumed. They don't even know. We're now learning of the day when the righteous anger of the Lord restrained for 6,000 years. 
What kind of pressure do you think is going to come from that? God is all powerful. It's going to erupt into a cataclysmic judgment. God's going to pour his wrath on this earth like it's never seen. We think Mount St. Helens was a magnificent, huge, traumatic event. That's nothing like the vials of God. Time and time again, the word of God has issued warnings of, of judgment to come. Talbot says, if any man finds himself in eternity unsaved and lost, that man will have no one to blame but himself. In every age and in every, even in the days of the tribulation, God is, as it were, trying to blockade the way of judgment. It's so true. You can't feel sorry for people who reject Christ. All we can do is compel them to come. And let the, we, we can't, it, it is sorrowful, isn't it? But we can't take their uh, blame or their complaining onto our, we can't, we've got to go on. We've got to go on. We can't focus on one person and one person only. There's so many people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. We need to be out telling and telling and telling and telling. I can't just focus on my kids. Hey, if my kids have already been raised, my kids know where they need to go. I can't just keep focusing on my kids. i got other people to tell. I'm just telling you, right? Hey, there are people that used to come to this church. They're no longer here. I can't keep focusing on them. Hey, I can reach out every once in a while, but I can't keep focusing on them. We've got to go to the next person. We, not just me. Don't say, yeah, preacher, you need to go to the next. No, you need to go to the next person. You need to dust your feet off. Go to the next person. If that person that you talked to before comes across your path again, that means God brought him across your path again. Then you talk to him again. Then you say, hey, are you about ready to come to church? Are you about ready to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't you think it's about time? God's about ready to call us home. But don't quit. There's more people that need to know Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of warnings. Roman numeral 2. Verses 2 and 4 back in Revelation. Revelation 15. I think that we sometimes get our minds on our things and we forget what God wants us to do. The anticipation of God's victory. You know, we know we are victorious, but let me tell you something. There's people that need to know Christ. That's victory. The sea of glass if you read here in verse 2 and 3, and it says, And I saw as it were a what? Sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. These are, these are the Christians during tribulation. They've received victory. How'd they get victory? Well, they were martyred. Uh, they received victory, amen, because they didn't take the mark. Praise God, amen. Let me tell you something. We don't have any tribulation like they're going to have. Are you getting victory? I hope so. I hope you're getting victory. Verse 3, And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Hey, child of God, this is what we should be saying. Come on, we're, we're supposed to be having victory in our life because we're standing on the word of God. That's what the sea of glass... Just so you know, that's the sea of glass with fire. That's the word of God. The Word of God has fire. Why do you think no one wants to hear the Word of God? Because it's got fire. Why do you think everybody's telling stories now and not preaching the Word? It's because it's too fiery. Amen. It burns, don't it? All right, let's look over here at number 2A, the Sea of Glass. Revelations 4, verse 6, we learned this locates the scene of John's vision at this point in the very throne room of God. As noted in the study of Revelation 4, the sea is the laver, which pictures the what? The Word of God, amen? The laver is the Word of God. You know, you know, the Bible says that fire will be coming out of his eyes. He's the, he is the living Word of God. The Bible is called the sword. It is sharper and pierces the divine asunder. What do you think he's going to destroy them with? The very Word of God. The fiery sword of God. That is God's Word. What do you think those Christians stood on when they were martyred? The sea of the word of God. That's why fire is there. That's a symbol of the word of God. They didn't lose. They won. Come on. We're not losers here. I don't, we're, we're walking around like we've lost. We haven't lost nothing. Yeah, the world is going to hell in a handbag, but we should, be, uh, we should be running around with squirt guns trying to fend off hell, friend. That's our job. We ain't lost. We've won. You didn't read Revelation? We've won. Go out there and act like we're winners and stop acting like we're losers. We're winners. 
B, the mingling with fire. In the Old Testament tabernacle, the subsequent temple, the laver was for what? What's the word of God for? It's for cleansing. You say, well, I, yeah, no one wants to hear it. It's because it hurts. You know, I got a pretty bad uh, poison ivy. And they want you to put all this coating on it, you know. It makes it feel pretty good. But the coating put on there puts a coating on there. And so in order to put new coating on there, you've got to get the old coating off. But once the, the old coating wears out, it still leaves that nasty, gross gel on their skin. So you've got to go wash it off. And while you're trying to do that, it itches really bad. And there's also dead skin under there. Well, you've got to wash it. And you've got you to scrub it off. And you talk about burn. You say, what are you talking about? Well, that's what happens when you use the Word of God. It's not all about joy. If you go to a church and you say you had a good word and there's no burning, there's a problem. Because there ain't any one of us in here that's sin-free. Say, preacher, I sure wish you'd give us a message that just gave us full joy and hope. Well, then that wouldn't be a very good message, would it? Because we all have sin that we have in our life that we need to get right. The Word of God should burn no matter what we look at. There's, hey, if we talk about joy, there's always a reason why we don't have it. Amen. It burns. It does burn. But you know what's neat about the Word of God? Is as I'm cleaning that, uh, cleaning that wound, and I get it clean, and then I put the, put the ointment back on it, man, it feels so much better. That's the Word of God. You get clean, it burns. But then it also seals it up and cleans it back up and makes you feel better. That's the Word of God. That's the word of God, friend. But you know what? Those who are lost, the word of God will never make them feel good. The word of God will place them into a place called hell. That's that fire, friend. They'll never stop burning. The illustration of the word of God, but the Bible is two-edged sword, just as it says in Hebrews 4.12. Not only does it save and cleanse, but it judges. It judges mingled with fire. Mingled with fire, amen. That fire, remember, we're going to be judged. How are we going to be judged when we go to heaven in Revelation chapter 4? When we're raptured into heaven, we're going to be judged according to our what? It's called the judgment uh, seat of Christ. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to cast our works where? Into the fire. Judgment. Amen. You know, what's interesting is the word of God or the preaching of the word of God, it should be fiery. Why? Because the word of God is a picture of judgment. We're, law, we're all sinners, friend. And if, uh, if we're going to get burned whenever the truth comes out. Amen. We don't like hearing that. That's awful. Mingled with fire. Victorious saints, verse number two. Boy, I'm telling you, we should act like it. Amen. Their identity. Their identity. Well, let me tell you this. I know we're talking about the... Uh, the ones who uh, martyred and in the tribulation. Let me help you with this. So are you. We're victorious saints. We need to act like it. They acted like it and they died. Their identity. They're the ones who have gotten the victory over the beast through uh, the victory through, noticed, through martyrdom. Number one. Number two. Notice their location. Their location. It says they stand on a sea of glass. Now, boy, this will preach for you, friend. Do you want to know how you can have a victorious Christian life? He, he's showing you right here. You know, you say, well, we're talking about the tribulation. Well, we're talking about saints, friend. And they're, the, way they, the way they have a victorious life is no different than how we should have a victorious life. They're showing you right here how to have a victorious Christian life. Can you see it? It says they're standing on a sea of glass. Are you paying attention? They're standing on a sea of glass. I'm not going to stand on my Bible, but I'm standing on the Word of God. And the only way you're going to have victory in your life is to stand on what you say you believe. And we talked about what stand means. Rooted in. Stand. We are to stand on the Word of God. Are you standing on it? Someone needs to stand on it. Amen. They stand upon the sea of glass on earth. They stood firm on God's word. Notice number three. Their instruments. 
their instruments in verse number two. It says, Then they have got no victory over the beast, and over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having what? Harps of God, their instruments. They had harps. Now, uh, if you don't know us already, but we talked about this in Revelations 5 and verse number 8. We've already went over this, but harps are associated with what? Does anybody remember? Worship. Harps are an association with worship. Harps and trumpets uh, are, are connected to heavenly worship. Are you listening? So what are they doing? What are they doing? Standing on the word of God, playing harps. Guess what, child of God, what we need to be doing. Hey, this is what this, you want to, I, I'm about you. We need to fill this church up. This is where it starts. We have to stand and rally together on the word of God and, and worship. They're declaring their God. That's our job. What are they doing? They're praising God. Are we doing that? Now, I'm not talking about a home. We've got to get out of our home. We've been at home long enough. It's not locked down anymore. We've been at home long enough. It's time to get out in the community. It's time to praise God in the community. You say, I don't know how to praise God. Oh, my goodness. You haven't got nothing to praise God about. We need to get our harps out. We need to get our trumpets out. That's our mouth. The Bible says that our voices are the trumpets of God, friend. You know what he wants? He wants you to, that's a sacrifice, isn't it? Not hardly. Not for what he's given us. D, the song of the tribulation martyrs. In verse number three. said, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Calling Jesus the King. Amen. Isn't that awesome? There are three songs mentioned in Revelation. The first one that we we seen in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 9, we saw the new song. The new song. This is sung by the four beasts, or the 24 elders and the angelic hosts. The new song. It's a song of the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. See it in verse number 3? It says, uh, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Isn't that awesome? It's a song of redemption. Aren't we have, we have some songs that we should be singing because we're redeemed. Number two, they have the unknown song in verse number three. The unknown song. This is also sung by the hosts of heaven, but was known only to the 144,000 Jews. Talked about that in Revelations 14 and verse three. And number three, we saw the sea, the song of Moses. The Song of Moses. Look over at Exodus chapter 15. I don't know that we'll read all this, but it's uh, just to make look over at it. Exodus chapter 15. How many that uh, there is a Song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15? Now I'm going to say we're going to read this and then we'll see if you can put it to song. Amen. <laughs> now remember this would have been in Hebrew so it would be a little bit different to try to put English into song amen I can't wait to hear that one day won't that be different you know what would be neat is to be able to actually hear the original Hebrew I can imagine that as a beautiful language Exodus 15 look there it says then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, and the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. Are you listening? They're singing this song. Listen, and put together what's going on here. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They've sank into the bottom as a stone. 
Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them the, and that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Isn't it amazing they sang this way back then, and they're going to be singing this again to the Lord? And with the blast of thy nostrils and the waters are gathered together, the flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And thou dost blow with thy wind, and the sea covered them. And they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Isn't that amazing? Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among thy gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Thou stretched out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them, and thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Isn't that awesome? Hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Thy people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestinia. And then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, and the mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. And all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over <laughs> they'll be stiff O Lord till the people pass over which thou hast purchased well, that's beautiful isn't it thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thy inheritance in a place O Lord which thou hast made for thee to dwell in and in the sanctuary O Lord which thy hands have established the Lord shall reign forever and ever for the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Here you see the word of God. Victory with the saints and death and judgment for those who were wicked. Do you see it? The sea was passable for those who were saved by Christ. But the sea is not passable for those that don't have Jesus as their Savior, it becomes judgment and damnation. See the Word of God? The Word of God can either save you or it can put you in a place called hell, friend. There's only two ways. That's a picture of the sea, friend. What a beautiful song. Amen. Look over at, at the, uh, well, we won't read that one. That one's pretty long. I hope that you would look over at Deuteronomy chapter 31. That's another song uh, that was recorded by Moses. Both of these songs are appropriate to times experiencing great tribulation. Uh, but if you read those and understand, uh, those songs will be sung to the Lord Jesus Christ during this time. It actually brings those songs to life, don't it? It gets a picture in your mind. I, it does for me. All right. The martyrs of Daniel's 70th week sing two songs. The song of Moses, the theme is God's faithfulness to Israel. And the song of the Lamb, the theme is redemption, excuse me, through the blood. All right. Let's hit E. We'll finish E and then we'll close. E, the content of the song of the martyrs. I wrote this right next here, and I think this is important for you to understand, is that songs are important. All right. Are they just singing any song? Are they singing 95.5 or whatever that station is? I don't even listen to that anymore. I listen to uh, uh, FM radio. We can actually listen to some Southern Gospel. But are they singing an 80s song? We all like 80s songs. <laughs> are they singing a 60s Beatles song? Why not? So what's, what's, the, what's the importance of songs and music? I want you to understand there is an importance to song and music. A song and music, the ones that, are, are, that we should hold important or close to our hearts, uh, are written with the heart of God. And these songs that they're going to be singing to God were written with God and, and they're, they had a right relationship with God. Now, there are people today, <laughs> we've seen a lot of them, and they say they're Christian artists, but they seek the wealth of the world. Okay? Let me help you with this. We don't need the world's help or TV's help, which, you know, maybe, maybe they'll do good with it. Uh, but most of them don't. Amy Grant. Uh, and what they're doing is they're seeking money. Their motive is money. Amen. 
you got to be careful what you listen to and call it God singing. you got to be careful to the music. If, if you're going to worship God, you need to listen to someone you know actually has a relationship with God. I'll tell you what, this is, uh, and I'm not trying to lift anybody up. We have a missionary friend who sings, and uh, I like to listen to him sing because he sings with his heart. I see it on his face, and when he, it doesn't matter how many times he'll sing a song, and it'll bring a tear in his eye, and I know he's singing about Jesus Christ. That's a song I want to listen to. If I'm trying to get in, in, in sync with God and I'm trying to hear from God, I'm not listening to uh, uh, this contemporary Christian music. And we're not playing it over our intercoms. And we're not singing it in our church, amen, uh, because of the fact that it does matter where the song is written and how it's written and who wrote it. It does. You can put blank words in there and have a fake saying, just like Judas, and it has no meaning Amen. I don't like listening to someone tell me something they don't believe. Anybody like a salesman? Try to sell you something they don't even really care about? A bunch of liars. I don't need to hear a salesman for Jesus either. I want to hear someone who's sold out. Songs are important to God. Handwritten with a heart that they are written in. Interesting thing, if you go look at the hymnals, which everybody thinks those are old, go look at the ones who wrote them what they were going through, where was their heart, where was their life. That's why they're so powerful. That's why people from all times, when you have a funeral, guess what they're asking for to be saying? Amazing grace, how great thou art. Hmm. Number one addresses a sovereign God. The song they sang, it addresses our sovereign God, Lord God Almighty. Now, I want you to understand something. You can say, Lord God Almighty, all you want, but it's a different thing when you're saying it with your right heart. You know, we're going to be talking about salvation at the, uh, the uh, uh, funeral. And, you know, salvation has to do with your heart. It does. It has to do with your heart. Believe in your heart. and Confess with your mouth. We need some confessors. Well, we need some confessors. Amen. We don't need no more protesters. We need confessors. The Bible says Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. He didn't come to condemn the world. We should be seeking and saving, but we've got to take a stand and do it. Number two, the celebrates divine attributes. Thou only art holy. Divine attributes. He's the only one that's holy. I hate being around people that think they're just better than you are. There's only one holy, friend. There's one holy person. Now, there's some people that, uh, that I really like. They may do things some different, a little bit different. Amen? Let God deal with them. If they're saved, they're going to heaven. Let God, you're not their judge. Amen? Uh, you know what? Maybe you can be Jesus to them, but we're not learning from them. Praise God. We've got to get on and tell some others about Jesus Christ. They need to come to Lighthouse Baptist Church. You need to be excited about your church. Number three, it magnifies the rectitude of the divine government. Divine government. It says, just and true are thy ways. Who's going to set up the government? Right after this, Jesus is going to sit on the throne, friend. That's a good thing that they're directing that song towards, isn't it? Because he's fixing to sit on the throne, amen? This is significant in the view of the judgments already poured out. And those about to come. Number four. It extols divine greatness. Great and marvelous are thy works. It recognizes divine lordship. Lordship is number five. It says king of the saints. Four is greatness. Five is lordship. Number six, it anticipates universal dominion. Dominion, verse number four. The first and last sentences of this verse look forward to the establishment of the millennial kingdom. It says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Notice it says, all nations shall come before thee. Uh, that's right, they sure will for a 
thousand year reign and he'll be on the throne. Who's the president? Jesus. Who's the king? Jesus. Amen. For all the world for a thousand years. They'll recognize it. They recognize as his dominion. Amen. That means he's over all. All right. We'll start at number Roman numeral three. Amen. When I get back, verse number five, we should finish chapter 15 next, uh, the next Wednesday we're together, and we'll be jumping into chapter 16, and uh, we'll be looking at the seven vials, vile judgment of chapter uh, 16. That one's a little bit longer. Amen. And we'll be going over where the battle is going to be at. That's going to be amazing. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll close in a word of prayer. Mark it, we're on Roman numeral three. Amen. All right. Brother Jim, will you uh, mind closing us tonight in a word of prayer, please? Amen. You are dismissed.